I could feel the heat hovering outside. In the cabin, it was bright and dry and cool. Almost too cool. Like a modern office building in the dead of summer. Beyond the two small windows, it was as black as it ever gets in the solar system. And hot enough to melt lead. At a pressure equivalent to 300 feet beneath the ocean. There goes a fish. I said, just to break the monotony. So how's it cooked? Can't tell. It seems to be leaving a trail of breadcrumbs. Fried? Imagine that, Eric. A fried jellyfish. <sighs> Do I have to? You have to. The only way you'll see anything worthwhile in this... This... Soup? Fog? Boiling maple syrup? Searing black calm. Right. We find ourselves once again with the duo of explorers who are the first to land on Mercury. Now, Eric has been refit, and they are now the first men to enter the thick, hot atmosphere of Venus. They are floating on the thick atmosphere, 20 miles above the surface, when something goes wrong. What's the trouble, Eric? You'd rather not know. He meant it. His voice was a mechanical, inhuman monotone. He wasn't making the extra effort to get human expression out of his prosthetic vocal apparatus. Only a severe shock would affect him this way. I can take it, I said. Okay, I can't feel anything in the ramjet controls. Feels like I've just had a spinal anesthetic. The cold in the cabin drained into me. All of it. Eric felt the ship, like you feel your body. But he could no longer feel the thrusters that were needed to take them back up and out of the atmosphere of Venus. This was a first trip to Venus. The plan was to hover 20 miles above the surface to test the ship in this strange, corrosive environment. But now they couldn't go up. How he needed to leave the ship to inspect it from the outside. But the ship was not cleared to go to the surface yet, despite being designed for it. But Eric had no choice. They had to land and inspect the craft. So they descended 20 miles into the dark depths. As they did, the temperature outside rose to over 700 degrees, and the pressure tripled. Finally, they touched down on the surface of Venus. The first men ever on Venus. Howie went outside and took a look for punctures or corrosion, but no damage could be found. He was able to narrow the problematic area down to between two service hatches, and on both wings. What could affect both wings at the same time? Howie could only think of one thing. The wings were not connected at any point in the entire ship except for one. Eric. Eric was the only thing the two separate systems had in common that could possibly explain both going down at the same time. The break in your circuits isn't inside, because you get sensation up to the second wing inspection panels. It isn't outside because there's no evidence of damage, not even corrosion spots. That leaves only one place for the flaw. Go on. We also have a puzzle of why you're paralyzed in both rams. Why should they both go wrong at the same time? There's only one place in the ship where the circuits join. What? Oh yes, I see. They're joined through me. Now let's assume for the moment that you're the piece of equipment with the flaw in it. You're not a piece of machinery, Eric. If something's wrong with you, it isn't mechanical. That was the first thing we covered, but it could be psychological. It's nice to know you think I'm human. So I've slipped a cam, have I? Slightly. I think you've got a case of what used to be called trigger anesthesia. A soldier who kills too often sometimes finds that his right index finger or even his whole hand has gone numb, as if it were no longer part of him. Your comment about not being a machine is important, Eric. I think that's the whole problem. You've never really believed that any part of the ship is a part of you. That's intelligent, because it's true. Every time the ship is redesigned, you get a new set of parts, and it's right to avoid thinking of a change of model as a series of amputations. I'd been rehearsing this speech, trying to put it so that Eric would have no choice but to believe me. Now I know that it must have sounded phony. But you've gone too far. 
Subconsciously, you've stopped believing that the Rams can feel like a part of you, which they were designed to do. So you've persuaded yourself that you don't feel anything. But Eric thought Howie was crazy, and the two of them bet $5,000 on who was right. Once they got home, they would find out. So Howie decided that he would just have to trick Eric into thinking he had fixed the problem. So as he went to sleep that night, he lay there thinking of how. He got up and put two buckets of water in the freezer, then went to sleep. The next day, Howie took two buckets of ice, suited up, and went outside. If Eric believed that he was too hot to work, then Howie would just have to cool him off. Howie opened the access panels closest to the loss of function in Eric's systems and dumped the buckets of ice in, then closed the hatches. Amazingly, this worked, but only for about 20 minutes, not long enough to get back to space so that they could head home. The solution was obvious and simple, but not so easy. Eric would take the ship as high as it could go on just the buoyancy of the metal ballast tank that it floated on. Then, at 20 or so miles above the surface, Howie would have to walk out onto the wings and throw the ice in while suspended miles above the surface. Hopefully this would again reactivate Eric's control of the thrusters, where they could fly out into space and head home. Howie did it, but as he was re-entering the ship, Eric was already regaining control of the thrusters, and not wanting to wait, he forced Howie to strap down with his burning hot suit still on. This resulted in catching the crash couch on fire, but Howie's suit was able to deal with that heat also. And by the skin of their teeth, they had just enough power to get them to their drive module that would take them home. The man with the thick glasses spread a diagram of the Venus ship and jabbed a stubby finger at the trailing edge of the wing. Right around here, he said. The pressure from outside compressed the wiring channel a little, just enough so that there was no room for the wire to bend. It had to act as if it were rigid, see? Then when the heat expanded the metal, these contacts pushed past each other. I suppose the same design on both wings? He gave me a queer look. Well, naturally. I left my check for $5,000 in a pile of Eric's mail and hopped a plane for Brazil. How he found me, I'll never know, but the telegram arrived this morning. Howie, come home. All is forgiven. Donovan's brain. I guess I'll have to. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate you staying this long, and since you did, hopefully that means you like my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe, so I can see you back here for the next one. Take care.